I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm Michael Rosenberger. Uh, this course, uh, this webinar is Visual Design in Canvas, and we're going to look at some best practice techniques and more. So today, uh, some of our objectives, no design terminology and the multimedia design principles. We're going to look at ways that after you're done with the course, you'll be able to evaluate your course material against these best practices and principles to be able to improve the design of your course. Um, we want to be able to create content using the layouts, make sure we're using our layouts and layout styles properly. We're going to be able to create um, a more visually interesting piece, um, content through graphics, pictures, videos, um, and that's used to enhance that. And then all of this really ties into a way that we can comply with ADA as well, because good design using these tools that we're going to talk about within Canvas is also going to um, help us adhere to uh, ADA. So I'm going to talk about that mixed in with all these design principles. The main focus today is Canvas, but I do want to kind of go through and look at the theory and the principles and understanding of why we want to design and how it helps. Um, so we know that when you have a well laid out article, a well laid out page, it improves the readability because it organizes the material. It helps to validate concepts when we use appropriate pictures, appropriate video um, within context of what we're showing. It helps to validate those concepts and it helps to reinforce that for students. Uh, having something that's visually engaging um, and not smattered, it helps people focus on the work, which again, helps to create an increased engagement for the student or the viewer on the end. Um, in turn, when we have people that are able to process the information, it's well organized, we find that it increases the retention and completion of students throughout a class. We found that Conversely, if you have a course that they're confused and they don't feel like the uh, information's organized well, um, it's just a wall of text and there's nothing more there. There's no presence of the instructor. It's just, again, like reading a book and then taking quizzes. We find that they don't complete, they drop out. So this is a way that you can also help increase um, completion and the retention of the course. And as I mentioned, one of the things that having good design and using these tools will do is it's gonna comply with the ADA, American Disability Act. So um, in this instance, uh, using visuals, auditory and cognitive, our layout, organization, the visual aspect, and then being able to add in audio, we wanna make sure all of that ties into what ADA compliance we need to do. And I'll show you some of these great tools um, as we go along. So again, I'm not gonna go into too much about that, I'm also not going to go into too much of the theories here, but um, I'm going to click on this. Within this webinar, I'm going to go between my presentation and web pages, so you'll see me clicking in and out. It's the best way I found to be able to uh, present information along the way. What I'm also going to do is copy and paste these links into the chat window, so you can click those links and open up that if you want to take a look as well. Um, the first thing that I like is in the multimedia learning book, uh, this is something that as a multimedia developer, it's kind of my Bible. Um, a mayor has been around for years, he's been doing this research and work for a long time, and he came up with these great 12 principles that we're looking at on this page. And some of these are gonna be Almost you go, well, duh, Captain Obvious, that's, that's easy to see. But when we're thinking about design, if we keep these at the forefront, a lot of times we don't realize that we didn't do it. So it's good to, um, even though they might be obvious, make sure we are doing these. So like the first one here, coherence principle. People learn better when extraneous words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included. So one of the things that I find, if we looked at, um, uh, busy page design. Let's see if we can pull up an image here. Uh, a lot of times organization, if you just look at this image right here, if the image does come up, uh, having a lot of graphics and a lot of information on a page may seem like a great idea, but it's very distracting. If you were to look at this page, everything is fighting for attention on it. So when we talk about this principle here, when we talk about the words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included, we want to make sure we're concise with the information that we provide. 
Um, signaling principle, people learn better when there are cues to highlight the organization of essential materials. Again, when you look at something like this page, you really don't have any visual cues, any symbols, um, any structure to the menu because it's multicolored, it doesn't stand out. There's nothing that really lets us know how this page is organized or what the main content is about. Uh, redundancy, people learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics and screen. When we talk about redundance principles, we're gonna talk about how we utilize repetition. And I'm gonna talk about those principles here in a second. Spatial continuity is a really important one. People um, learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented closer together rather than far. So we talk about alignment and proximity, how pieces are grouped together. Think about how a page with just text, you have blocks of paragraphs, and that helps in spatial continuity to understand that these are groups, these are groups, and these are groups. Um, temporal, people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented simultaneously. Um, and then we look at segmenting. So those two kind of fight with each other. When we're doing any type of design, we like to have all the content on one page. But a lot of times, what do we tell people like when they're doing videos? Don't do more than five minutes. Break things down into digestible chunks. So we want to make sure that all the information that we need for something is on a page. But we also want to take a larger chunk and break it up into multiple pages. So and then we have pre-training principles. Uh, modality, I won't go through each of these, but you can look these up and, and study these more. The last three, though, are something we are gonna talk about, which is uh, personalization, personalization principle, voice principle, and image principle. This talks about your presence in a classroom, and we talk about personalizing and humanizing a course, which is very important. Again, students will disconnect if all we have is this wall of text. We have no imagery or anything, but they also like to connect to the people that are in the course. So that's uh, very important as we move along. We'll talk a little bit about that. So those are some of the guiding principles overall for multimedia design and designing in general. But we have four basic principles here that we talk about when we talk about design specifically that those 12 principles are based on. And that's contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Again, I'm not gonna go into this too much. I just want you to understand some of the theory of the tools that we're gonna be applying here in a second. So one thing to notice is if you look at the beginning of the, in, uh, each of these words, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. We have C, R, A, and P, which yes, is crap. Your design should be crap, and the title of this is actually Crap Design Principles. It isn't that your design looks like crap, it just should follow some of these. So if you thought about some of those principles, contrast, and how we have the most important items being bolded to less important items not being as bold. We talked about the repetition of pieces, so you have an expectation that you set with an icon. Um, if that's used throughout a course, we know that they'll have an expectation that whatever's related to that icon is what's gonna follow, we'll look at that. And then again, we talked about the spatial continuity with alignment and proximity. Both of those are related to how we align items and how we group items by how close they are together. So knowing those different things, let's do a basic piece. And this isn't multimedia. This is strictly just that skeletal portion that we're gonna start with in Canvas here in a second. And that is your basic layout. Can you spot some of the design principles? So let's talk about those four design principles. Contrast, what's the main thing that we see on this page? At the very top in the most bold letters and the largest size, we see it says web designer wall. We obviously know that sets what the title is of the page. Underneath, we have a little miscellaneous information of who designed it, but the next thing to grab our attention are these headings. So these headings are a different color. They're still bold, but they're not as bold as the beginning piece. And that way you can see when you get the contrast, the repetition where we have a title, who it's by in a block of text, title, who it's by, block of text, title, who it's by, block of text. That's where we start getting that flow through repetition. Um, and then the alignment and proximity. One thing you'll notice is when you have a block here, you have a larger bit of white space in between. White space is open space, and that actually lends itself to separating and blocking um, different portions and grouping context. So you'll know that this is one piece, this is one piece, and then this is one piece. So those are some of the ways that you'll be able to see how we do that when we're talking about 
applying them in Canvas. So the areas we're going to focus on using those 12 principles and the other four design principles are we're going to focus on layouts, which is the bones and, and the meat and potatoes, um, the, stick, the brick and mortar, they would call it, of a page. Then we're going to look at ways we enhance again to talk about pictures, graphics, and media. We're going to look at ways you can personalize the course. And then we're going to look at something that's very important, which is using proper links. So another thing to realize is when you're going through this process, good design takes time. So start early. There are many instances with faculty where a week before the course, two weeks before the course, we're sending out information. Hey, come in. We're having open labs to help you organize your material, do better design. Um, we're here to help you. We've got hours blocked out. And inevitably, we, we do get some good um, faculty that come through and do the work and actually look to improve. But a lot of times we have people that wait to the last minute. We really, we can do some basic things to help improve a course, but it takes more time to really start going through and making sure there's continuity and design throughout. Another thing that you probably want to do is have peer review. Either come in with us and we can look through and say, hey, yeah, you're doing great. That looks like you're going down the right track. We can make suggestions. Maybe other faculty that are doing the same course could work together to help design one program and use that throughout multiple courses. And then, of course, plan to revise information. Even the most incredible layouts that you ever do, um, at the end of a semester, you'll get feedback from students and other people that say, hey, you know what? We could probably do this part a little different. Oh, this didn't really make sense. And you'll be able to revise and do that iteration of design, which is you know, plan, uh, develop, implement, and then revise. Plan, implement, develop, revise. So that's what we're looking to do. So within this webinar today, um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to go over the slides and talk about uh, some of these different principles that we said. The first one's going to be layout. And then I'm going to be jumping into a Canvas course, which I probably need to log into right now. Uh, so I'm going to log into my Canvas course. And I'm going to show you in Canvas courses how we um, apply these different principles using the tools that are within Canvas. So the first thing we're going to talk about is using headings. So headings include H2, H3, and H4. A lot of times in Google Docs, Microsoft, all these different programs, you'll see that little drop-down menu where it says heading 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, within Canvas itself, we don't want to use H1, but we can use H2s, H3, and H4 for smaller subsections. We're going to also look at bullet lists to help organize materials. So if you're giving a, a list of materials that are related to a learning concept, or if there's steps in a process, bullet lists are what you want to be able to use. So how does that look on a Canvas page? So in this particular page, I'm going to remove this load. There we go. I'm going to remove this guy because we're not at that point yet. But within here, anything that I type in, this one automatically has a heading to it because it knows, but heading three, you'll see it has heading two, three, and four. Remember I said heading one is not something that we want to use within Canvas. That's because at the top of a page, heading one is reserved for your page title. So whatever you name your page, that's going to be at the top. So why is this important? For one, you can see the hierarchy of the page. Again, remember, we're looking at the most important objects being the biggest and the boldest, and then going down in information, and then trying to block out information. But we also have a component for ADA in here. When you use an ADA screen reader, you have a way that a person can glean information from a page by going through and clicking on, let me see if I can bring up a, whoops, go away. Sorry, my top webcam menu is there. I need to move this down just a little bit. There we go. So if we look for, let's go to technology news. And let's look at all pages. Uh, BBC is a good one. So when a screen reader is looking through and you're looking at any type of page design, you'll notice this top part right here is the largest on there. A screen reader would allow you to look at the organization of a page by looking at the headings. So in this instance, they could start going through and go heading two, and you would see the worst um, 
the world's worst drawer stumps Al Gore, Vodafone. If there was a watch and listen, if this is an H2, they would know that there's a watch and listen, listen section, share with BBC, most popular. So it's a way that when you're using H1, H2, H3, and H4, that it organizes that information for ADA. But there's one really cool thing that I find, and how many times have we seen this happen? Or maybe you do it yourself. So say you type in heading, I'm gonna set this back at paragraph. And I have seen faculty and others design this way where they go, oh, I want that to be bold. I want a font size of 24. Okay, and there's my heading. Well, for one, it's not gonna be ADA compliant, but for two, you just took multiple steps to do the same three that setting a header this way would do. So it's a way that you can streamline the process. And again, the organization is what we're looking for in using those headings. Um, the bullet list organization, again, down here, uh, super simple. In here, you have only two options within Canvas. Uh, either you can have this as a bulleted list item uh, through the bullet list here, or you can do it numerical. If this was a stepped process, we could simply convert this over, and steps are one, two, three, and four. Again, I'd like to remind you, if you do want, there is chat uh, here, so if you do have <coughs> Excuse me, if you do have questions, you can type in questions um, as we go along. Um, if you do have a microphone or anything like that, you can always chime in if you like. Uh, and uh, I'll just try and answer those in, uh, in time as we can. So that's the first thing that we want to do. And again, this isn't a really aha moment. Many of you use that already, but you might not understand the principles of why we're doing that, both for ADA compliance and setting that hierarchy. The next thing we want to talk about is visuals. Now remember, we've already got the layout tools in Canvas to set the bones and the structure of a course, but now we want ways to enhance it. So pictures need to be in context. Remember that first point when we talked about Mayer's 12 principles is we don't want to add a whole bunch of information that isn't necessary or is unrelated. We want pieces that add to the context of the learning that's happening there. Um, another way that we can do that is with icons and symbols to set expectations. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then we'll also look at videos and using a linked video versus an embedded video. So let's go back into our course and look at this page. Now, we've set our layouts and our headings and you can see that there isn't much information or there's a lot of information, but there isn't any graphics here. A couple ways that you can add information, and the, the top questions that I get is, how do I add an image and then maybe move it off to the right? So in here, you do have this embed image, and uh, one of the tools that we can use is a Google search. I always like to show people that Google's a good way to search. So say we wanted a picture of books picture. When you go in, the second piece here is the images tab. Now, we want to use copyright free images. So a quick tip here is if you go under tools, you'll see that you have a tab for usage right. Go ahead and just say labeled for re reuse and modification. It's going to limit down your choices, but you, ha you have a lot of pictures that you can use without worrying about infringing on copyright. So we can simply look at an image. And then if you want, you could download this image, upload it into Canvas and utilize it that way so it's in the files in your course. However, one of the things that you can do is if you know this is a persistent link and isn't gonna disappear, we can simply copy this link and we can paste this into the URL area. Another ADA compliance thing when we talk about designing is every picture in here will have something called alt text. Alt text is a way that you do a short description of what the picture is in relation to the context. So if this was a piece that's talking about a particular type of book, you might say these are old books that demonstrate how paper has changed. But in this case, if we're just using it as a, a representation of books, you can say books picture. Books picture. And then in here we can obviously set our image size as we want, so we can say update. So now what people ask often is, how can I move this around? So if you go up to your alignment at the top, you can align this to the right. Let's go ahead and save. And now you can see that there's a book picture 
that's in the reading section. So as simple as that, we've taken this page from something that just has um, text and put in just small images. Again, we don't want to overdo it, but this is just a way that you can increase the interest that's in your page visually. Move this down again. Keep getting into those controls at the top. What if I put that right there? There we go. So the next thing when we're looking at pictures, um, we're going to look at video. So video is an interesting one. If you were to go to YouTube, I'm just going to go to my YouTube account really quick here. And when you're simply, oh, anybody know that the new Thor is coming out? Um, I kind of geek out about that because it actually looks like it's going to be a good Thor, but that's for another time. So um, if you didn't know, you can always share a YouTube link by clicking the share arrow. Sometimes it's over here in, in Chrome, it's over to the side. And you can simply copy a link, go into Canvas, edit your page, wait for it to load up. And then you can paste the link in and hit return. Now immediately, Canvas is going to recognize that as a YouTube video, and it gives you this little identifier here. Now if I click save, it does an okay job. It gives you this little icon. It gives you a link to it in case there's a screen reader that would link out to that. Um, but when you click on it, it's going to start playing, but it's small. So as a designer, I don't necessarily like the look of that. If I wanted something that's more in line and looks a little better, here's a quick tip for you. You can use embedding. So when you go into a share tab here, you'll notice that there's another area for embed. When you click embed, you can see what it's going to look like within the page and you just copy and paste this uh, code here. Now in the embed options, we want the just the video to be showing so we don't want to show suggested videos that's one of the problems we have is you know a video ends and all of a sudden you see cat juggling videos and we lose students so we want to disable that we don't need player controls and we don't need the title of anything we just want that video in there so quickly copy the frame or copy the code and then go into your canvas tools now this is a bit advanced for um, some faculty because you go into a coding area and the easiest way, I'm gonna just delete this out of here. And the easiest way to find yourself when you're looking at code is to add a bunch of spaces where you want this video. And we're gonna go up to the HTML editor, scroll down until you see a whole bunch of, see these NS, NBSPs, that's spacing. We can highlight one and paste in that cold code. So an iframe is essentially just a frame within a page that's going to load that video. When you first load it, you're going to see it's a gray frame. Don't worry about that. When we save the page, look what happens. Now we have a nice clean video with just a play button that's in here. So when we click play, it's going to allow them just basically to start and stop. You can use the player controls. I usually take them out so they only have start and stop capabilities and they can just watch the video. But that looks a lot cleaner in a page than trying to do the other just linked way to do it. Can we download our personal images? Um, personal images as far as... Uh, I, if we could clarify what you mean by the images that you're looking to download, I can um, answer that question definitely. If, if you have a photo that you want to download instead of like you downloaded the books, if I uh -huh. had a photo of something I took somewhere and I want to show students. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So any picture that's out there um, within your Google Drive or anything like that, you can uh, download to the desktop. I think I had an image here. Let me see. This is... Uh, when I was out fishing, say this is something that you wanted to add. I was going to use this for personalization. But if you wanted to upload this into a page, um, you could simply, let me let this load. If we were trying to put this in this page, go over to images, upload that image, find it on the desktop, and then go ahead and upload it and it would become part of that. Does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and anything that's out there that you can download, um, and you can go into the images area and upload them here. I'm going to go Thank ahead you. and cancel that. Any other questions to this point? So again, these are just simple ways, again, with a few interesting little steps of adding a video and some books. Let me get this over here. There we go. Um, one of the things that's neat about um, Canvas now is they use what's called dynamic scaling or um, uh, dynamic design. So if you were to put this on a small 
uh, phone, which would look like this. You'll notice that it scales down the images, it scales down all the reading and everything. So if you're going on a phone, students could actually do their work on phones as well. It doesn't look as nice as it does when it's big, but at least you can go through and do that. So again, um, pictures and graphics, remember they should be in con uh, context of what's going on. Uh, video, I like the embed versus the linked. Uh, in the resource page, I will have a short video that demonstrates that. I've still got to put that together, but you can always reference this video as well or just contact me and I can walk you through that the first time. So we kind of hinted at icons and simple uh, symbols to set expectations. Um, when we're talking about visuals and we're talking about the power of what a visual can do, if you're not convinced, I want to show you a cool little game. And you've probably seen something like this before, but it's amazing how embedded visuals become in what our experience and our learning has been. So if we were going through here, if you were looking at each one of these, you would be able to name most of them. Um, I don't know what the first one is, but here we have Shell, we have Nike, uh, Playboy, I just heard about that one. I have no idea what that is. Uh, Pepsi, for you old school people, we have Atari. Uh, I don't know what the orange bulb is. Toyota. But you could go through and probably name most of those pieces on there and think about what that symbol means. When we say a picture's worth a thousand words, it's really a relational piece that's really powerful in learning. So when we say shell, you're thinking gasoline, you're thinking of a road trip, you have this experience that really encompasses just that one picture. Um, Pepsi, Atari, um, AT&T, Chevy, Adobe, all of those are gonna conjure up some memory. So we wanna be able to utilize that and those expectations when we're within Canvas and how can we do something like that? Well, let me show you an easy way to do this. Again, um, let me go back in here. Google Image Search is a great way to be able to find those free resources. Make sure, make sure you're using the tool that shows copyright release and that they're Creative Commons. One cool tool here is Pixabay. This is specifically all free, high quality images that are, if you look right here, no copyrights, they're Creative Commons public domain. So that means you can download, modify, change. You don't have to worry about attribution. Um, if you notice in my presentation here, let me just go back. Um, anytime I use links and whatnot, I'll put attribution in there. But when you are using uh, these images in here, we don't have to worry about attribution. So if we wanted something like a book icon, we could look through here and immediately we could find something that would work for us. Now, with these, we're not gonna be linking to them. Uh, similar to the other pictures we were talking about, you would want to go ahead and free download this, use the image area, upload that into your course, and then use those within the course itself. But that's Pixabay, which is a great way to uh, load content in there. A couple things, it's a somewhat free site, so it can be slow. Notice at the top, these are sponsored images by Shutterstock. Those are not free. They just help pay the bills for all the free um, pictures that you can find underneath. And it's fairly extensive. So that's a really good resource of why, um, what you would want to use in there. Um, an example, let's see if I can, uh, let's go back into my course here. Let's go back into present. Let's go back into the course. Sorry about all the moving around. This is the only way I can do this in a webinar that I found works well. So within modules, what I do is I use these small icons for each one of the sections that I know that are gonna be repeated throughout. So for each module, I do an overview and I list objectives. So I use a little navigation piece for the overview and a check mark for objectives. Now, students, if you were doing readings, you might have that book icon that we talked about. So that way a student, if they were just trying to glean information, and go, oh, hey, what's the reading this week? They would immediately see that book icon over the text and be able to know that, oh, the reading is this. So it's important to use symbols and iconography throughout the course. It really is a very powerful way to organize and help um, people parse that information that's in your course. Uh, we've gone through that, important to clarify. Um, Creative Commons, just make sure that they are free resources. Let me close a few tabs here so we can keep myself organized. Uh, and go back in here, full screen. So 
we talked a little bit about those 12 principles, the last three when we talked about images, personalization, voice, ways that you can personalize a course. Now, this is something that's super powerful. Um, I talk about this a lot in courses. Um, if I was to say, who's somebody that has affected you in a positive way, a teacher? You immediately, or say, who's your favorite teacher? You would immediately picture somebody in a course. Now, for a lot of us, we didn't do too many online courses. We only did face-to-face. -face. So we had that relationship. And a lot of times what mattered is they were fun, they challenged us, they had great information there. They had a presence that made them important to us that we remember about that. A lot of times in our online classes, we lose that because even though we may add images, we may have really interesting text, there's nothing that brings it together. So this is where the multimedia principles are really going to <clears throat> add value to a course. So what do they do? They give a course a face and a voice. It encourages personal expression and sharing with experience. So when you share your experiences, that helps students learn by relating material to something that's real world and they in turn can do that themselves. And again, this can be done with pictures, video, and audio, but remember, we can do this through text. When you type out your personal experience, at least it's adding some context and real world environment into what that learning is. So how do we personalize a course? Um, introductory videos, we're doing a big portion on that right now, um, trying to get people to put introductory and orientation videos for their course. So they introduce them, hi, I'm Mike Rosenberger and today we're gonna be in COM 100. This is section blah, 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 and my office hours are this. So those type of things, and then walking somebody through the organization of your course is a very powerful way to insert yourself and humanize that course. Um, biography pictures. If I were to go in and look at each one of the faculty and see how many people have that gray little stiff icon um, instead of a picture, <clears throat> it would probably be at least half. So that's a way that you can do that. Update your biography or create a biography page that you use within the course. Um, announcement videos, introductory discussions for you and your students. So you may do an introductory video, but you can always add a Canvas discussion to allow students to post a fun picture of their life or them or whatever they want to represent them. Um, and then your experience related to lessons. So what does that look like in a course? This is a video assignment course that we did just uh, in the last month here. And as the facilitators, of course, we added in pictures of ourselves with a little bit of that biography. We could have done video portions um, and added that in there as part of the enhancement, but we decided we would just do pictures since a lot of the other content was gonna be video as it was. Uh, I mentioned announcements. So instead of typing out an announcement, one of the things that you can do is make a video that goes through as part of that announcement. If somebody's in a math class and they sent you a question, oh, Mr. Rosenberger, I'm having a problem with question number three on this assignment. Well, instead of just typing back to that student, create an announcement and do this as a problem that you do as a video answer. So that way you get your presence, they know who you are, they can relate to you, and you can kind of empathize, you have more um, inflection in your voice, you can sympathize with them, and it just builds a better rapport within a course than just typing out some text, here is how you do this, boom. So um, that's just some great ways that you can include yourself within a course. I don't think we did, um, workshop overviews. So this I wanna show you, I think we use some different text, um, different thing, ways you can break up pieces um, here, organization using um, not just bullet points, which we do in here, but you can also use tables to organize information within Canvas. Um, in this course, we didn't use a lot of images necessarily, but we did include the video portions in there with links as well. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to hit, where are we at time-wise? 234. Yep, so we should be good here. Um, again, I was trying to get about 45 minutes so we can answer any questions we might uh, have here. Uh, proper links. So this is something that's very interesting. If you see this image here, you see that read more. and 
this comes from a time in the infancy of the internet where people didn't really even know what a URL, a link, or anything was. So we wanted to direct them to the proper links to guide them through a web page. So when you were looking at um, a story, you always wanted to say, oh my God, read more if you want that. If I look at this page here, and this is on TechCrunch, which is a technology um, website, you can see that they already have a link at the top. There really isn't a use for the read more. And why wouldn't we want to use it? Well, think about those ADA uh, screen readers again. Um, I had a video and I'm going to post it in the resources, but it's somebody going through and using their screen reader to do what's called link parsing. So just like you can tab through and hit all the main headings to know how a page is organized, you can also tab through and just read all the links. So if you had a page that had a bunch of read mores and didn't have these top pieces, what would you hear? You would hear read more, link this, blah, blah, blah. Read more, link this, blah, blah, blah. So there's no context of what that link is actually doing, let alone for the people. They can read through here and they can kind of see read more, but we wanna make sure that the links are both informative and they have a call to action. So here's a couple simple um, examples of bad and good for you. So bad, click here to see super cute doxy puppies or photos. So that's bad because we used click here. It really doesn't describe anything, it's not informative. The good would be see super cute doc sound puppies or photos. So we know that we're gonna see some cute doxies. So when we click this, this is obviously a video. I happen to be a doxy daddy, so um, doxy dogs. But within what we're trying to do, let me close this tab again, I'll close this tab. Um, you can see that we gave it context. Instead of saying click here to see something, we're just having that informative piece. So that link, when somebody in a screen reader or somebody just looking through can see cute doc sound puppies, I wanna see that link, boom, there it is, or it reads as that. Um, another way that you can do that is to create an action. <clears throat> a bad example, take the simple visual design survey and then they have a continue button. That's the old school way of doing it. A call to action is take the simple visual design survey. So when we click that, we're going to what? Take the simple visual design survey. And it, we know it's gonna open the survey and it says, I just learned a cool best practice about links. Of course you did, that's true. This class has been helpful. Of course that's true. And then I'm gonna submit this. Amazingly, I've got 100% on the survey when I'm presenting it like this because I always answer it myself. But hopefully you're finding that a useful tip when we're looking at links as well. So we just wanna make sure that um, you're using an action or direction to let that link stand on its own and give information about what it is. And again, we do this not only for context when you're looking at it, but for screen readers as well. So, to kind of wrap up today, um, I do have a lot of these resources. I started putting these together on a recently released resource page that CTL has, and it's located at pcctl.weebly.com. So within here, um, if you went to resources and we go to the instructional media area, that's my area, and we clicked on this, this has a lot of different resources um, that you can click and check out. But down here in this bottom corner is the visual design for instruction. That's gonna say Canvas here in a little bit. But here is the page that's gonna have all those different resources. Again, we're gonna have the link to this presentation. Um, I'm gonna do a short video on using Google or Pixabay to find Creative Commons images. Um, the embedding YouTube video in Canvas. I was going to link to a video that I used in the past but it's outdated, so I'm gonna create a new one here. So within the next couple of days, that'll be updated. Um, one of the things that I kind of glossed over, because I wanted to bring this up in the end because it does take a little bit of time, is right here when we're talking about in the meat and potatoes and bones, this tip, tip here talks about using Google Docs to design um, and not Word. First of all, we don't want to use Word and try and copy and paste information out of Word because Word has a lot of other formatting, so it won't go into um, your Canvas page very well. But if I was to go into, let's go into a doc here, and I'm just going to open a document here, and you'll see that I've pre-formatted this with a title, subtitle, heading one, two, three, four, and then normal text. So I'm gonna highlight all this information out of here, and I'm gonna go into, let's go to this course. I'm gonna edit this page one more time, 
And I'm just going to paste this at the bottom just so you can see what this does. And I'm going to save. So not all of the formatting elements, you'll notice um, the picture did not come through, um, the title and the fonts do not come through, but you'll notice your heading categories do come through. And why is this important? Well, um, one of the things that came up recently is we have instructors that do face-to-face -face classes where they design handout materials that they're going to be giving to students. So if I have load up this, uh, teach knowledges piece that I want to print and hand out. That's great. Now I can make this an embeddable and put it in canvas But what if I want to take the information and put it into a page? Well, I can grab this information if it's formatted correctly using all of our headings and Pieces here and I can at least get the basic text out of here into my course Same thing again. I can edit I'm gonna go down to the bottom just remove this I'm going to paste this in and I'm going to save and here you can see that it grabs again if we were to look here this is a heading one it's going to grab some of these smaller subheadings and whatnot but it's a way that you can design pages and have them ready for your face-to-face -face printout but you can also take that material and use it to copy and paste and move it into a canvas course as well so again, don't use Microsoft Word if you try and copy and paste out of Word. There's a lot of extraneous information that's going to get in there. It's going to turn out all wonky. The only thing you'd have to do after this is just upload those images like it is in here. Uh, where's my document? There it is. And these are all, again, download those, upload them into Canvas, and then um, add those in as left justified. I do have a tip that I will send out this next week I've been testing where if we publish this as a web page, Google Docs allows you to publish something on the web. Um, you can grab all that information. It will already include the images, but I'm not going to release that just yet. Just look for that in the next week when I do some follow-up with this and trying to help um, give you more information. So those are some of the basics. Uh, let me get out of this. Um, on this page, I will send you the link. Again, PCCTL um, resources, instructional media. I will send it in the survey uh, for this quick webinar that we did um, to follow up with you. And then, as always, if you have any questions, you can always get a hold of me. Um, look for the follow up email. And then I would love to work with you on any ideas that you have. I know I've had some of you in before in doing um, instructional content design where you just say, Hey, can you take a look at this? What else can I do to improve? Some of it I've said, Oh, hey, if you were to change some of this stuff a little bit here, maybe add this, that, and the other thing, that's great. And there's other times I look at these and go, you know what, you're on the right track. Kind of keep that way that you're designing it to make it your own. So um, any other questions to this point? <coughs> Sorry about the cough. My allergies have been killing me. I'm actually happy that I got through all this without too much problems. <laughs> um, I have a question. Sure. Um, it, it may not pertain to the class, but I can see you, right? So how do I do a video of myself so my students can see me, like you said, in the uh, introduction or? Oh, excellent question. So under our resources, we have a piece that we're doing right now that's actually available for grant funding, and it's called LEG Grant Program. I'm going to click on this. This is a link right here, and you can pull this up. And what we're trying to do is get a way that you can um, make your course student friendly. A big part of that, part two and three, is humanizing and personalizing your course. So in here we talk about what it is, some of the strategies that you can do, and then when you want to record yourself, we have a tool called Screencast-O-Matic. And in here it's going to have a tips for video recording, which you can click on, that talks about how you want to do it, some of the recording best practices, um, and it goes through on that, but it also, whoops, I closed the wrong Sorry. So that is accessible to us right now. We can use it. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So if you go to the pcctl.weebly.com, um, go to resources, this okay. is all available in here. Um, there are still grants available if you're designing your course um, that you can get uh, awardees, a $275 grant if you complete all these different pieces. So it's a great way for you to do what we're talking about with humanizing and personalizing and a way that you can get pay, uh, paid and get uh, professional growth for it as well. So this actually has all the Screencast-O-Matic tutorials to walk you through how to record yourself, how to do a screen capture if you wanted to show some pieces in your course, um, and different ways that you could utilize Screencast-O-Matic. Any other Thank questions? You. Yep, absolutely. That's a great question.
actually it was a terrific segue to this wonderful page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, so it's 2.45. Um, I had hoped there would be a little bit more questions. I was trying to cover that as quick as possible. Um, trying to think if there's any other really cool tips that I have in here. Uh, and that's really it um, for design. Again, just using the paragraph styles um, and then including those pieces within there. So um, we're gonna end it for today. Uh, I will follow up, look for that follow up email. Um, with all these different resources and links to the websites, uh, all the pieces that we talked about today. And then please do contact me uh, if you want help doing something, if you have questions on doing something, if you want me to do something, if you just don't feel like you can design um, a good graphic, you can't find something, contact me. That's what I'm here for. I'm the instructional media developer on campus, and I love, love, love doing the multimedia stuff. So. Uh, with that, I bid you a great day, have a terrific weekend, and look for the follow-up.